Will our children and teachers please come forward? so that they might truly be the saints of God. We ask, O Lord, all of this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Life is difficult, and life sometimes is painful and, and, and just not particularly good. I know, even when I live with you, Mom. <laughs> yeah. And yet, at the back of my head, I know that my life isn't about avoiding pain and suffering and all of this stuff. I know that my life is about the claim that God puts on me, the call that God has for me. In fact, who God has made me to be. The problem, though, is that I spend most of my life, in some ways, avoiding pain and suffering and difficulty. And, and when I do that enough, what I wind up doing is just kind of going around avoiding all of the potholes potholes in life. And the problem is, I wind up not actually doing the things that God wants me to do because I'm too busy avoiding the things that I don't want to do. And that's part of what all of our, our readings here today are about. Now, that doesn't mean that we're, we're lemmings who are trying to find the nearest cliff to run off and jump and create suffering in our lives. That's not what we're talking about. What we're saying here is this. In some way, our lives have to, in some ways, engage with what is put in front of us. And if we run away from those things that are put in front of us, we'll wind up, we'll wind up with something that really isn't authentically our lives. Now, in our gospel reading today from Matthew, we have a bit of the same situation. Now, the Beatitudes, as they're given to you in, in Matthew 5, 1 through 12, that's what begins the Sermon on the Mount, right? And the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus basically teaching on the law. And one of the things he saw, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the chief priests and all the religious leaders doing, is that they used the law in some ways as a way to avoid actually doing what God wanted them to do. Now what Jesus says right after the Beatitudes is, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. So we know in some ways the law is really important to him, but we also know that he doesn't see the law in the same way that the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the chief priests see it, right? And so Jesus begins his teaching on the law with these Beatitudes. And basically what Jesus is saying is this. If you think that you will please God by avoiding people who are impure and avoiding difficult things, and running away from suffering, and keeping unpleasant things away from you, all in the name of the law that God gives you, you will in fact be doing the very thing that God doesn't want you to do. In other words, the law can't be an excuse for not living your life so that you would be transformed by grace. The law, in some ways, as Jesus will show us, has to be that thing that draws you more and more into who God wants you to be, not something that keeps you from actually being with God as God would want it. And so Jesus gives us all of these, these beatitudes, and we look at them and we say, I don't think I can do all of this stuff. This stuff is really, really, really hard. How could I ever do this stuff? I don't, I, don't, I don't want to be poor or poor in spirit. 
I, I, I won't. I have lots of stuff. I know. Sports cars and barbecue and sunglasses and whatever else. I know. <laughs> so, Jesus gives his disciples and all the crowd both the good news and the bad news. The good news is this. All of that stuff that the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes and the Sadducees were telling you about the law, about, about how you were not following the law well enough, so that's why God doesn't like you, and that's why God isn't sending a Messiah to Israel, and that's why that, 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 that sense of you're not good enough, and, and that's why God doesn't like us. He said, forget that. That stuff is nonsense. That stuff is keeping you actually from being who you're called to be. And so he sets off with these Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes on the surface of it look like they're almost impossible to do. How could anybody do this? And yet what Jesus is saying is this. The Beatitudes are not something to be achieved. Like, you know, I I ran a four-minute mile, and now I'm done with the Beatitudes. See, he's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is the Beatitudes are a way of being in relationship with God. If you take up this practice of, in some ways, doing the law the way from your heart, and seeing things the way that God would have us see things, in fact, fact, seeing things the way that God sees them, you'll be transformed. And in that transformation of taking on, in some ways, the very difficult stuff in life, you'll be able to follow me all the way to the cross. You'll be able to do what I'm doing. Now, It's hard because life is difficult. You know, and as I listen to a lot of your stories, I'm aware of how much difficult stuff many of you have gone through, stuff that I can't even imagine going through. And yet, here is the amazing thing. You're still here praising God. Even though you had to go through that difficult stuff, you're still here praising God. And part of what Jesus is saying is this. Look, our true vocation is to continually always be praising God with our whole being, our heart, our mind, our soul, our our, our whole being, our whole strength to praise God. And yet to be able to do that even when life gives us a lot of crummy stuff. Now, if we look at the revelation to John, what we see is this, and it's brilliant. We've got these saints, all of this great multitude, and this great multitude has come out of the great tribulation. In other words, they have struggled and suffered much like all of you have struggled and suffered. And guess what? What he says is this. These people are praising God. Salvation to God and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to them. And then he and then the, and one of the elders says to John, do you know who those people are? And John says, I have no idea who they are. I mean, I'm, I'm having this vision, but I, I just see all this crazy stuff. So you tell me who these people are. And he says, guess what? Those are the people who have had their robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, I I struggle sometimes with colorblindness, but last time I checked, if you put your robe in blood, what color will it turn? Red, exactly! But we've been given this crazy vision in which these people are dipping their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and what happens is their robes are turning white. And so 
what we have here is that the, the, they're dipping them in the blood, and it's not the stain from the blood that's being soaked up. What's being soaked up is the purity, the love, the forgiveness, the righteousness, all of those things that Jesus embodies. That's what's being soaked up into their, into their robes. And he says, guess what? They're putting on these robes that are made white in the blood because they, in some ways, did not forget who they were and were able to deal with the suffering and the difficulty in their life and still be able to have praise for God on their lips. What John is doing is giving us this great eschatological vision of heaven. That eschatological vision, all that means is the, the, the vision of what will be and what ultimately is amazing, right? And he says, guess what? The vision isn't that people don't know what suffering is. The vision isn't that they, 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 they avoided suffering. The vision isn't that they were pulled away from suffering. The vision is that in some ways they modeled their lives around the suffering of Jesus. And not only that, but now they're able still to praise God in spite of all of the crazy stuff in their lives. Now, sometimes I get texts from Jeffrey, right? And he will text me like at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night, right? And he'll say, Father Robert, it's not fair. Life isn't going the way I want it to go. And I will text him back, you're right, Jeffrey. It's not going the way I want it to go either. And then we have a pity party together, right? Exactly, right? Okay. And you know what? You know what he says to me, though, sometimes? And it leaves off, he'll say, yes, but God still loves me. Yes, but God still loves me. And I'll say, you're right, Jeffrey. God still loves you. And so do you. You love me, right? Yeah, yeah see there. And then I realize all the crazy stuff that happened to me during the day, all the nonsense that I had to endure and suffer and all the difficult stuff. Then I remember Jeffrey's smiling face. I remember Kathy's smiling face. I remember Patsy's smiling face. I remember Ben's face. <laughs> <laughs> right, Craig? <laughs> all right. And, and, yeah, right? And, and the vision is this. The vision is this. All the saints remember the other saints who have gone through difficult stuff hard stuff and they're praying for all the other saints the saints that have gone before them the saints that are going with them the saints that will come in the future and the saints who've gone through struggle say we haven't forgotten that we need to pray for others going through this stuff and not only that but we haven't forgotten that God loves us and we haven't forgotten that we were created to praise God. Now this is the beautiful vision. The beautiful vision isn't that we put life on easy mode. It's that we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters and praise God no matter how crazy and difficult and weird life gets. I look at Jeffrey and Jeff and Joe and Billy and Elaine and Nancy and I think it's a good thing I got these people that I'm walking this walk with. Good news is that life is going to be perfect. The good news is that our praise and prayers to God will be perfect in spite of the world going crazy.